chapter 12, um, verses 22 through 34. This is another shout out. I see a lot of young people in the building today. That's awesome. Just to see young people wanting to serve God and just do uh, 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 admirable things for God. Because we live in a world today where, you know, when you're young, you know, they're just telling you, you know, just to focus on you, focus on your own dreams. But it's good to see a lot of young people understanding what life is all about at a young age. And please, please be encouraged. Your work and your labor is not in vain. Please understand that. And it's glad to have you here today because I guess this word is here for you. So I'm just encouraged to see a lot of young people in the building. Uh, Luke chapter 12, verse 22 through 34. And the word of God reads, And he said to his disciples, Therefore I tell you, do not be anxious about your life. What you will eat nor about your body what you will put on. For life is more than food and the body more than clothing. Consider the ravens, they neither soar nor reap. They have neither storehouse nor barn, and yet God feeds them. Of how much more valuable are you than the birds? And which of you, by being anxious, can add a single hour to his span of life? If then you are not able to do as a small thing as that, why are you anxious about the rest? Consider the lilies, how they grow. They neither toil nor spin. I tell you, even Solomon in all his glory was not arrayed like one of these. But if God so clothes the grass which is alive in the field today and tomorrow is thrown into the oven, how much more will he clothe you? O oh, you of little faith, and do not seek what you are to eat and what you are to drink, nor be wearied. For all the nations of this world seek after these things, and your Father knows that you need them. Instead, seek, the king, seek, instead, seek his kingdom, and these things will be added to you. Verse 32, fear not, little flock, for it is your Father's good pleasure to give you the kingdom. Sell your possessions and give to the needy. Provide yourselves with money bags that do not grow old, with a treasure in heaven that does not fail, where nor thief approaches and nor moth destroys. For where your treasure is, your heart will be also. Here in Luke chapter 12, what Jesus is doing and what's going on here is Jesus is talking to his disciples, right? And so he's talking to his apostles that are with him, the, the 12, but his disciples. And what is a disciple? A disciple is basically a person that wants to follow after Christ. And you must understand, uh, Jesus has a lot of people that want to follow after him because if you read um, in the earlier chapters of chapter Luke, you'll see it says the multitudes and the crowds, right? And so there was a lot of people that were following Jesus that wanted to be disciples. They wanted to follow after Christ. And so Jesus is um, talking to his disciples. He's talking to his, fo his followers. And in Luke chapter 12, he's letting them know um, not to be so anxious and not to get so worried. Because why? Because they're about to endure maybe some tough times. They're about to endure some persecution. And so the the Lord wants to kind of get them ready for the task at hand, right? And so today as we look at this and we just dissect these um, 10 or 12 verses, I want us to just to, um, see a couple points and then we'll be about our way today, right? But the, um, what I want to talk to you today about is paralyzed by fear, right? And so what does that mean to be paralyzed by fear? Because if these disciples are um, looking at this task to go about and um, uh, uh, preach and proclaim the gospel, then they must understand that they're going to endure what? Some hard times, some trials, some persecutions, right? And so if they do that, then what's the thing that's going to creep in? Fear. Because how is it going to end? What's going to happen? And so Jesus says, I have to prepare you and get you ready for this journey, right? And so as we look at it, this is what Jesus is doing, right? And so he's calling them uh, uh, as disciples to count the cost. 
Um, Dietrich Bonhoeffer was a young man that was on fire, was an evangelist for Christ, right? Dietrich Bonhoeffer was an evangelist, a young man that loved the Lord, but he was around uh, during Hitler's time, uh, around when, uh, he, uh, when the Germans wanted to kill all the Jews, right? And so he was a young man that was bold and wanted to take a, st- a, a firm stand for Christ. And Dietrich Bonhoeffer knew that he might lose his life, right? And so he understands what it means to be a disciple. And Dietrich Bonhoeffer, he writes in his book, A Cost of Discipleship, he says, when Jesus bids a man to come, he bids him to die. And so what Dietrich Bonhoeffer is saying, uh, when Jesus bids us to come to him, he, he bids us to die. He bids us to die of everything that we want. He bids us to die of everything that we think we need and put our trust and our hope in him. He's saying, he's saying count the cost. Not, not just look at it from a, a physical death, but also from a spiritual death. He says, you have to lay it all on the line for me. Christ says, you, you have to be willing to forsake others for me. And we don't hear that type of language today when it comes to following Christ. We don't hear that type of language. We hear the type of language that Jesus is your homeboy. Jesus is your friend. Jesus is just waiting for you. Jesus is longing for you. He's just, he's just waiting for you just to come alongside. Oh, can't you see? And yes, that is true. Jesus is loving and he's caring but also because he's loving and he's caring, he what? He requires for us to live a standard in our lives. And if we are going to be disciples and if we are going to be followers of Christ, we must understand that we have to count the cost. And sometimes when we look at it and we want to count the cost, then that's what we'll do. That's when fear will, will start to get its best at us, right? Right? And so for us, we must understand we have to die to everything. We'll never experience what it means to uh, understand the full worth and the grandeur of God if we won't surrender all. We'll never. Not sometimes. Let me tell you, you will never experience fully what God has for you if you only give him some time it if you give them hard, hard time at devotion, because that's what you're going to get. Some time at love will allow you to experience what? Some time at intimacy. Half-hearted devotion will allow you to experience what? A half-hearted love. You've got to surrender it all. There's nothing different from in our own personal relationships then the same thing it is within our relationship with God and what God requires. If you're talking to an individual and you're entertaining an individual and you really long to get to know this individual and you want to, um, uh, you want to know more about this individual and you're saying you're willing to do whatever it is, right? And if you're giving all of you and they're not giving all of them, do you think that you're fully going to understand truly who they are? Do you, if, if you're going 80% and they're going 20%, or if you're going 80% and they're going 50%, or they're going 70%, they're like, well, I, I'm, meeting you, I'm meeting you there, but I'm still not giving you my all. And you're like, no, I, I'm not getting all of you. And that's what Christ is saying for us today. We want all of Christ, but we're, we're not willing to give Christ all of us. And, and Christ is saying, what is it going to take? When will you see? When will you get the picture? And he says, well, you know what? You you may not see, you may not understand, but for you as Christians and as you as believers, you must understand. You must count the cost. You must understand you have to be willing to give it up. You have to be willing to surrender it all for Christ. Now, here in verse 22, he talks about not being anxious and not wearing, right? But then he talks about what not to be anxious for. He says, don't uh, be anxious about this life, what you will eat, nor your body, nor none of these things. But just previous right before that, in verse 13 through 21, he talks about the parable of the rich young fool, right? And he talks about the parable of this this rich young fool that says uh, he had a lot of fruits. And he basically, he was like, what do I do with these fruits? Oh, I know what I'll do. I'll build more barns and I'll build more houses to store more fruit in. 
And the Lord says, you fool. Your soul is required of you tonight. Why? Because you're, you're coveting. You want more. And Christ says, this, this is opposite of, of, of what it means to be a Christian. This is opposite of what it means. Christ says, no, you have to be willing to give it all up. You have to be willing to lay it all down. Because what? When you, when the, what the man was doing, he was just thinking of himself. He was being selfish. And so what, the, what, what we need to see and understand is that, is that this man, he was just trying to be greedy. That's all he was trying to do. He was, he was trying to be greedy. But if you understand, greed and worry, they, 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 they kind of exist together. Because greed says what? Greed says you, you never can have enough. And worry is afraid that God will never be enough. And so, and so what, what, what the Lord wants his disciples to see, he wants them to understand and see, this is the attitude and this is the mindset you should have. And so as we look at verse 22, the first thing I want us to point out here in this passage is the first thing I want us to see is what God creates, he also will sustain. The first thing is what God creates, he also will sustain. God will sustain the, the universe. It is not just dependent on God for its origin. It depends on God for its continuity of existence. The universe can neither exist nor operate by its own power. God upholds all things by his power. It is in him that we live and move and have our being. In him we were created to, to live for him. The first thing we must understand is what God creates, he will sustain. He was trying to encourage his disciples. He said, I created you and I made you. I have a purpose and a plan for your life. And if I created you, I, I know how it's going to go. Not only do I know how it's going to go, but I know what you need. I'm going to keep you. I'm going to sustain you. There's two questions we must ask ourselves. To understand what life is all about. One, what was God's goal in creating me? And two, how can I bring my life in line with that goal? What is God's goal for creating me? What am I made for? Am, am I made just to take up space? Uh, am I made just to chase all my dreams, chase all my goals, chase all my aspirations, and just get all the toys or just live my life to the fullest all about me? What is life all about? And I'm glad you asked. Because I want to tell you, life is about, one, you knowing God, and that's why he created you, and two, life is about you making him known. That's it. You ever wonder what life was all about? That's the hard question. That's the answer. He's answered it for you in the Bible from Genesis to Revelations. Well, what is my life about? What does God have planned for my life? He wants you to know that the first thing is he wants you to know him. He wants you to have a relationship with him. He wants you to fellowship with him. He wants you to, to, to know him more, intim more intimately. That's the first thing. And the second thing is what? He wants you to make him known. He didn't just save you so you could sit and twiddle on your thrones for your own goodness. He saved you so you can go out and tell a lost and a dying generation in the world about a God that loves them and cares for them and so uh, desperately wants to use them in a way that they, wouldn't, they don't even know. This is why we rally on Sundays. We rally on Sundays to get encouraged. We rally on Sundays to get strength, to go out there to this world that is lost and that, that, that needs God, this godless world. And, and this is why we rally up. This is why we gather today. That's why Hebrews 10.25 says what? Don't forsake the gathering of the saints. Don't forsake this thing, this corporate worship, because this is where you get your strength from to go out there and face that world and tell them about the, the, the goodness of God that loves them and cares for them them. But this is how we get paralyzed by fear because we start to what? We start to get anxious and we start to get antsy. And when we do that, that's when fear creeps in. Because when we get anxious, we don't trust in God. 
When we get anxious, what do we try to do? We try to do it on our own. We try to, we want to be in control. And God says, no, I'm in control. Surrender your life to me. Give your life to me. And I'll show you what life's all about. So don't be paralyzed by fear. God has great things for you. But you must trust in him. You must believe in him. And you must know that he will sustain you and he will keep you. Time in after time in, if you look at stories of, of people that were used greatly by God, some of them didn't end well. But it may didn't end well here on earth. But the reward is greater in heaven. And, and I'm not saying we're so heavenly minded where we're no earthly good, no. That's all the more why we're earth, we have earthly good because we're, we, we know, we understand that this life is going to pass us by. Have you ever thought about it? If you're going to live forever, have you ever thought about how you're going to do that? Does that ever cross your mind? Do, 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 do honestly, do we just sit sometime and ponder and just wonder what heaven will be like? What we'll do? Who will see? Will we eat? Will we work? What will all day worship and praise be like? Because yes, God, I love you and I, I long to know you. And, 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 but after like four or five worship songs, I feel like I'm tired. My heart is willing, but my flesh is weak. It's not that I don't love you. What will that be like? A new body that I'm going to adore you and worship you forever? Inexhaustible? What will that be like? And for us as Christians and us as believers, if we're going to live forever, do we think about that? Does that cross our minds? Because if that's our home, we want to get there. When you go on vacation, you don't take everything with you. You just pack a suitcase. And at the time, after the beaches, enough beaches, enough fun in the sun, enough food, and enough fellowship, and even those nice cozy hotel beds or saunas and spas and cabanas and whatever it is you have or whatever you want to do, what starts to happen? You miss home. Because it's, it's not the same like sleeping in your own bed. It's not the same like knowing who your neighbors are and what your neighbors are. It's not the same of knowing your surroundings. It's not because it's not home. What Jesus is saying to them here is you disciples. Yes, it's going to be tough. Yes, it's going to be difficult, family. But family, this is not your home. Get your eyes off you. Get your eyes off yourself and focus on me. Focus on what life is about. Life is bigger than you. Life is bigger than, than, than what you think it is. Life is all about me. And Paul tells us that, and Paul talks about that in Ephesians 1. He said, God created us what? For his glory. God created us what? For his praise. God redeemed us through what? Through his blood. God did it all through what? Through him. It's all about him. It's all going to be about him. It was never about us. But some way we've got it twisted and swayed. In the 18th century, you know what the world did? The world thought it was. They thought it was all about God. They thought it was about religion. In the 19th century, they thought it was all about uh, uh, war. They thought it was all about the nation. In the 20th century, they think it's all about self. And that's our world today. Social media, everything. You know what it's trying to do? It's trying to distract you. Your better life now. Your dreams now, 10 better ways of how to get a better you now, and all of these things. And what are we doing? We're eating those things up. We're, we're constantly eating up those things, and we're feasting upon those things. 
And what does those things have? What eternal value do those things have when you stand before the Lord and say, Lord, I got such and such followers. Lord, I made such and such blogs. What eternal value does that have? But this is what our world is all about. It's all about self. And what Jesus says, if you're going to be my disciple, if you're going, if you're going to, to live a life that is pleasing to me, if you're going to live a life that's honoring to me, count the cost. It's not about you. It's never been about you. But if you think that's a selfish thing, it's not. If you really think I'm selfish, just look at the cross. If you think, that, if you think I'm such a selfish and an angry and a, and a harsh God, just look at the cross. Do we take time every day just to meditate on the cross? What the cross does for us? what the cross has allowed us to have relationship with God, what the cross freed us from, what the cross saved us from. The first thing we must understand, what God creates, he will sustain. We don't have to be paralyzed by fear. The second thing I want us to see is, in verse 24 and 25, It says, consider the ravens, they neither sow nor reap. They neither have storehouses nor barns, and yet God feeds them. On how much more in value are you than the birds? And which of you, by being anxious, can add a single hour to his span of life? But the second thing, point is, I want us to, we must understand and see that we have value and worth. That's what Aaron was trying to teach us last week. He's been trying to go, we're going through the gospels. He wants us to see the love of Jesus that God has for us. I think a lot of us aren't motivated or a lot of us won't step out on our own um, uh, to, to serve God and do these things because we don't truly really embrace God's love for who he has for us. But when you know someone loves you and someone cares for you and they'll do anything for you, what will you do? You'll lay it all down for them. That's what Christ is saying. He says, I value you. You have value and worth. The ravens, the birds of the air, they they don't even, I provide for them. You're more valuable and you have more worth than them. Lest you forget and don't understand, Job 38.4 says what? When the Lord was talking to Job, he says, where were you when I laid the foundations of the earth? You tell me if you have understanding. Yes, church. Times look tough. Times look difficult. Times look uneasy. But it's not up to us to focus on the times. It's up to us to focus on the God who is in control of the time. And like Spurgeon said, when I can't trace your hand, help me to trust your heart. When I can't see you and I don't think that you're near and I don't think that you're close, help me to trust that your heart is after the heart of man. That your word stands forever and tried and true. And Isaiah 40 verse 8 says, everything will fade, but the word of God stands forever. Tell me this, if everything is going to fade and the word of God stands forever, why is it that we're trying to get all of our information and all of our understanding and everything else but the word of God? He says, that's what's going to stand forever. That's what's going to last forever. And you wonder why you have difficulties. You wonder why you're stressed and you wonder why you have anxiety and you wonder why confusion and all of these things are coming in your life. Where are you putting your emphasis at? Are you putting your emphasis at on other things or the word of God? He says, this will stand forever. You know why it'll stand forever? Because it is God. John 1.1, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was God. The Word was what? God. And he what? He dwelt amongst men. He what? The word is sakane. He tabernacled amongst men. The same thing that he did back in the Old Testament when they built a tabernacle so their presence can be with God. God says, you don't have to build a tabernacle. I dwell. I live inside of you. 
He wants to dwell with you. He wants to have fellowship with you. But if you don't understand your value and your worth, then you won't see him as that. You won't see him as a friend that sticks closer than a brother. You won't see him as when everyone else forsakes you, he'll never leave you. You won't see him as in your darkest hours, he's the only one that's going to be there for you. This is what he's saying. You have value and you have worth. The third thing I want us to see, verses 25 through 28. It says, and which of you by being anxious can add a single hour to his span of life? If then you are not able to do a small thing as that, why are you anxious about the rest? Consider the lilies, how they grow. They neither toil nor spin. Yet I tell you, even Solomon on all of his glory was not arrayed like one of these. But if God so clothes the grass, which is alive in the field today and tomorrow is thrown into the oven, how much more will he clothe you, O you of little faith? The third thing I want us to see is your faith must have actions. Your faith must have, must, have, it must have actions. H. A. Ironside says, "If my lips and my life do not agree, then the testimony will not amount to much." The world is looking for hope. The world is looking for change. The world is looking for love. The world is looking for everything else. And you know what they're willing to do? They're willing to give their lives, their estates, their families, their children, and everything else up for it. Why? Because they're looking and longing for something that only God can give, only God can fulfill. And so he's looking for a generation who will stand out and be bold and represent and say, I'll be different. I'll go against the current of this age and of this world. I'll go against it and I'll stand out for a cause that is greater than myself. This is what God is looking for. Faith, you must have actions. You can't just talk a good game. Every time I get up here and to preach or to teach and proclaim the word of God, I get nervous. And my heart, it, it, it shudders with fear. Why? Because I am in charge of teaching the holy word of God. That this is not just some pop and circumstance that look at me for 30 minutes and let me get your attention. Let me tell you some jokes of how to do this and how to do that. This is not what church is about. Church is about gathering together with people with one like mindset and opening up the word of God and seeing what the word of God says. Not saying what my opinion, what I wanted to say. Not saying some cute and cuddly quotes, what I want people to hear and let their, their ears feel all cozy and, and, and calm. It's proclaiming his word of truth. Because I'm going to stand before God one day. And none of you are going to be there. And where is my heart's posture at? It's not about the approval of men. It's about pleasing God. And so what he's saying to his disciples as they're going out, he's saying, hey, don't be anxious. I, 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 know, I, I know you think you need food. I'm going to take care of you. I, I, I know you think you need this. I, I got you. But when you said you would follow me, did you, you understood what that meant, right? He says that if anyone wants to follow me, he says he, what, he must deny himself, take up his cross, and follow me. He says, D deny yourself of everything that you want and say, God, you're better. But you won't have that mindset and you won't see that unless you stop focusing on yourself and start to look at God and see the big picture. That it's all about you and it's all for you. But that's for my good. 
The third thing we must understand is your faith must have actions. Because if a Christian is wearing all the time, that's a misrepresentation of a true Christian. If we're telling a God about one who can provide and we're always constantly wearing, where, where's the peace in that? If we're telling a, a, a world about a God who is love, but we're always angry and always mad and you can't talk to us, where's the representation of Christ in that? That's what a Christian is. Our lives are to represent Christ. And so Christ said, hey, foxes have holes, birds have nests, but the Son of Man has nowhere to lay his head. But yet, I'll provide. When we're paralyzed by fear, we don't think God will provide. And God is trying to allow his disciples and let them see, hey, I'll provide for you. And the fourth and the last thing I want us to see is in verse 32 and 34. He says, fear not, little flock, for it is your father's good pleasure to give you the kingdom. Sell your possessions and give to the needy. Provide yourselves with money bags that do not grow old with a treasure in heaven that does not fail, where no thief approaches and no moth destroys. For where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. If we're going to follow after Christ, we need to ask ourselves daily, where is my heart's posture towards God. Because it's the things that he lists all before he said those verses. He said, well, let's work backwards. If your heart is focused on me, if your posture is focused on that I'll provide, that I'll make a way, that I'm bigger than life, that I'm greater than life, then none of those things won't really matter. Why? Because you'll understand that I'll provide for those things. You'll understand that life is greater than those things. You'll understand that there's a one that cares for you and he'll never leave you nor forsake you. The last thing I want us to see is let your hearts be upon your work. Let your hearts be upon your work. Being a, a disciple for Christ understanding what that means, what that looks like? Is your heart really treasuring not just only Christ, but the work that he has for you? He says, for where your treasure is, your heart will be also. You want to know the number one way to overcome being paralyzed by fear is feasting on this daily. Let this be your treasure. Not Instagram. Not Facebook. Not Snapchat. Not relationships. Not being the life of the party. Let this be your treasure. There's so many jewels in here. Inexhaustible. John Piper says, he says, when we get to heaven, we're going to stand before God. And people are going to say, the reason why they didn't read their Bible enough was because Facebook and Instagram. Because truly, truly Christians, hear me, hear me. I, I'm not playing here. Hear me. If heaven is your home, then this has to be your treasure. Because this tells you all about it. This tells you what you're to do. 
This tells you of, of the danger of missing the mark. Of just living your life, living your best life, living for you, doing you. YOLO, you only live once. This has to be your everything. As I heard the story of Crawford Loritz as he's telling that his father was a chaplain for the Atlanta Falcons. And back when he was a younger, uh, um, Crawford Loritz, when he was a younger boy, he said he loved Walter Payton. And Walter Payton was one of his idols. He looked up to him. He ate Wiggies. And one day the, uh, the Chicago Bears were playing the loud Atlanta Falcons. His dad was preaching at a chapel for the, um, for the uh, Chicago Bears and Atlanta Falcons. And he meets Walter Payton. He meets his idol, his, his, his big um, hero. And, and his eyes just bulge and he lights up. But you know what? Walter Payton is, is sitting at the table and he's eating Fruit Loops. And Walter Payton's like, what? what's going on here? Fruit Loops? You, you say you like Wheaties. I eat Wheaties because you, you say you eat Wheaties. This is what gets me strong. This gives me strength. What's the thing says? Wheaties? I don't eat that stuff. Stuff's nasty. <laughs> said, what? Because all Wheaties was to Walter Payton was an endorsement deal. It was to make money. It was to gain fame and popularity. And that's the same thing that Paul tells Timothy in 2 Timothy 3.16. He says, all scripture is God, breathe. What was Paul saying to Timothy? If this word for you is just an endorsement deal, if this word is for you just a self-help book, if this word is for you just when you need hard, how to deal with hard times, you just go to this, if this word for you is not your, your treasure and your heart's desire and you for your life to long up with these words of this, if this word is, is other things for you, then you won't understand it. And you have to let this word get into you. And that's what Paul was telling Timothy. Before you tell others about this word, let this word get into you. But you must understand that this is your treasure. You must understand that this is your everything. As I finish, one of the most encouraging verses, and I want to leave us with this as a worship team will come up and get ready is Luke chapter 18, verse 29. And he said to them, truly I say to you, there is no one who has left house or wife or brothers or parents or children for the sake of the kingdom of God who will not receive it many times more in this time and in the age to come, eternal life. He says you don't have to be paralyzed by fear of the daunting task of what it means to say that I'm a Christian and that I love Jesus. He says, whatever you give up for me, he says, I'll give it back to you tenfold. And tenfold doesn't mean that you get a bigger house. Tenfold doesn't mean that you get that car that you wanted. Tenfold doesn't mean that you get that relationship that you wanted. Tenfold doesn't mean that you get that job that you wanted. Tenfold means that you have an eternal home laid up for you. That's not made with hands that will never crumble, that thieves can never rob, thieves can never come in, no one can never take advantage of you, you'll never cry again, you'll never worry again, you'll have true peace. 
So whatever is paralyzing you, whatever has you daunted and saying, God, no, I'm scared, I'm afraid of the unknown, of the uncertain, he says, whatever, you give up. I'll give it back. So you young people, don't think that you got to hold your life together for your own dreams. Let him go for God. And he'll show you what your life is about. He'll blow your mind. Don't waste your teenage years trying to search and do things for yourself. All about you. It's all about you and your dreams and your aspirations. And then you waste your teenage years and then you waste your 20s because it was all about you. And then you waste your 30s and then you're 40 and then you're just wasted away. Give your life up for a cause and lay it down for Christ. He's worth it, y'all. He's worth it. Difficult times will come. Yes, troubled times will come. But our God is worth it. He loves you more than you'll ever know. Whatever you're holding on to today, whatever has you paralyzed today, to not take that next step, to not be bold for Christ, to not take that step out on saying, today I'm going to live for you and give my life for you, whatever it is, I encourage you to let it go and give it to God. A wise man once told me, he said, you'll never regret being obedient to God. You'll never regret it. He's worth it. And not only is he worth it, but it's a must, you. It's a must, you all. Look at our world today. They're dying, they're lost, they're confused, they're living their best life now, and they're headed to ultimate separation from God. And God has woken you up, has given you breath in your lungs to see another day. Why? Not for your own goodness and not for your own good sake but for you to press in deeper to know him. For you to press in deeper to trust in his promises, to trust in his word. But you, for you to stand and be bold for Christ and to let a loss and a dying world know there is a God that loves them. There is a God that cares for them. Will you get to know him today? Let us bow our heads and pray. Dear Lord, would you, would you help us today? Whatever is holding us back, whatever has us paralyzed, at the hip, at the leg, at the arm, whatever it is, God, that's saying we can't give it all for you. We're asking today, God, that you help us surrender it. Some of us don't know how to do it. We're asking, God, that you show us. For the ones that do know how to do it, we're asking God that you strengthen us, that you lead us, that you help us, that you put in our hearts a desire and a passion and a longing to give it all for you because you're worth it. Help us to see that today, God. God, we pray right now for this morning's offering, God. We pray that whatever we give, 
is out of heart's desire. We pray, God, that this is used for your kingdom, for your glory, and to make you known all across the land. Would you bless us right now and be with us? In Jesus' name we do pray. Amen.